Garden of Salvation is one of my favorite raids, even though some people don't like it as much. But with it being reprised, I wanted to put out a brand new guide to kind of guide players, especially players that are not as experienced as this raid. Many of the guides that are currently out on YouTube are dated or maybe don't have all of the updates based on playing the raid for a long period of time like I have. So in this video, I'm going to make a guide. I'm not going to make it too long, but I'm going to give you enough detail for any person, any person at any fire team will be able to get through the Garden of Salvation raid. So in the first encounter, obviously you're gonna go through, there's a bunch of ads you have to clear out to go through a Vex portal. Go through the Vex portal and get to the first room. In the first room, you're gonna to start to get some of the mechanics that we use throughout the raid. I'm gonna put a map up that's, and I'll put credit on the screen, from a Reddit user who put this map that I think is a really good representation of how these encounters work. In this room, you're gonna notice that there's a wall. You can't get through the wall. The only way to get through that wall is to shoot or unshoot these tether boxes. When you shoot them, they become, you see like a tether that comes to you, and the further away you, you get from it, you notice that the tether turns red. That's your warning that you're about to be too far from the tether to be able to complete it. So to complete the chain, you're gonna, someone's gonna need to shoot it, and you're gonna need several people to link up with the chain to be able to open the door. There's no boss or DPS in this encounter, so you don't need anything like that, but you do need add clear supers, add clear weapons, and survivability, because there's gonna be a ton of ads you're gonna need to kill. You're going to group up into two groups of three, and uh, they will do the same activities, but it'll overlap, and I'll tell you about that here in a second. What we usually call them is, is Team 1 and Team 2, because Team 1 stays in the first room, Team 2 goes to the second room. So let's, let's start out with Team 2. Team 2 is going to connect the tethers, and they're going to move forward, and while they're moving forward, they're going to need to kill every ad, including there'll be Cyclopses, and again, I'll show this map very briefly, these Cyclopses will show up in different areas and you have to kill them as well. And if you're not careful, you'll miss them, which will prevent the rest of the encounter from occurring. The other thing in this particular encounter, they're overload champions, so you will have to keep in mind that you need to kill those. Once you've killed all of the adds, you're gonna see an Angelic that'll show up in the middle. Once this Angelic shows up, you need to kill it as quickly as possible. That Angelic is what ultimately will allow you to open the doors next. Before we get to opening the doors and basically allowing the first team to skip over you and go to the next portion of the encounter. Let's talk about the boss and what you're doing with the boss. So during all of this, the first team, what they're gonna be doing is they're gonna be killing ads, same as you. And then every so often the boss is going to go and basically put spit on the ground. Um, when that spit happens, you have about three seconds to pick it up. If you don't pick it up, it wipes the entire fire, fire team. The trick with this is, is that once you pick it up, you have a two and a half minute debuff before you can pick one up again. If you pick a second one up, you die. And in some cases, if you're stuck and you don't have anyone else to pick it up in that team, you may have to do that anyway because that will at least prevent the wipe. But with three people there, as long as you're doing things qu uh, quickly, you should be fine. So the first person picks up the spit and they have that two and a half minute debuff and they're still killing ads. At some point, then the boss is going to move over and drop a spit again. So what we typically do is we on each team, we decide who's going to do it in what order. Like, I'm going to do it first, I'm going to do it second, I'm going to do it third. You don't have to do that. That just makes it easier, and it's going to definitely make it easier if you're with LFG groups. So you need to continue to do that. And what you're doing is you're buying time for the second team that I showed previously to basically go in and kill the Angelic. Because once they kill the Angelic, the tether door, again, I'll show this map, one of the tether boxes will be open, and they'll be able to tether and complete to open that next door. So that's now from the second room that's opening to the third room. When this happens, you're gonna hightail it immediately and head all the way through that room and try to get to the third room. When this happens, of course, the boss teleports to the second room. In the second room with the, that second team, that team is then gonna to have to do the same thing. They're gonna to have to pick up the spit and do that juggling while that first team has gone to the third portion and is basically doing the portion where they're trying to kill the angelic, tether the box, and open the door. So you kind of see how this works. Like if you look at this uh, graphic that I'm gonna put up again from Reddit, this graphic shows you how each team hopscotches or just jumps over each other exchanging roles. You keep doing that until you get to the last tether boxes. In this, in this portion, there's going to be, these are more difficult. There's gonna be a series of three tether boxes. You have to kind of connect one after the other. Now the good news is once you get to this portion, everyone in the raid encounter can potentially help out to get those open. But again, some of them are a little bit uh, further away, so you might need more than just one person or two people. You might need extra people, especially the last one you have to connect. Once that is complete, you are then going to run like crazy. 
All you're doing at this point is there'll be a series of Cyclops that are gonna show up and the boss is also gonna be dropping spit. You need to continue moving forward and pick up the spit or you will wipe this fire team. Now again, if for some reason you get in a situation where someone that still has the voltaic uh, charge on them, if that person still has on their timer and they have to pick up the spit, that's fine because they'll die, but they'll keep the rest of the fire team moving forward. Once you're done with this, you're complete with this encounter. After this, there is a jumping puzzle and then you'll get to the second encounter. Now with the second encounter, you'll again, one of the things I love about this raid is it progressively picks up on each of the encounters a little bit more mechanics. In this particular encounter, you're gonna pick up a little bit more of the mechanics around the tether box that will continue to be the way it's used throughout the rest of the raid. In this case, you're gonna have an area that, and I'll put a map up real quick, that looks almost like a baseball diamond. And if you think about it, you have four potential tether boxes that you have to protect over time. So what you're gonna to wanna to do, this is how my team does it. Every team might be a little bit differently. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to divide up into four people who are gonna be the people who ultimately guard plates one, two, three, and four. Then you're gonna have two runners. The runners will be people who wanna be mobile and have no problems with potentially having to change what they're doing in the encounter. So these should be more experienced players if, if possible. Before people guard into plates, it's, they are pretty simple roles. Outside of these, stay alive and do ad clear. There's probably multiple ways to do this, but what I'm probably gonna do typically is I'm gonna have my place person who is defending the plate staying at one and the runner that's on the left side, I'm gonna have that person uh, basically stand and kill all the ads while the first the other four people start running towards two. We're gonna kill all the ads. We're gonna then kill the angelic that shows up. And at that point, the tether box opens up. What I'm typically gonna do is the person who is defending the plate, I want them to always stand closest to the tether box. And this come, there's a reason for this later. And the person who's running is going to be the person that connects back to the back portion of the tether box. So in other words, the person who stays on the plate is more forward and the person who is the runner stays behind him. Once I am through that, once I'm complete with that, then we're gonna just sit there and we're gonna get that, that buff. That buff, that enlightenment buff that's gonna allow you to kill the shielded ads. If you don't have that, you won't be able to kill those ads. One other thing too is if for some reason someone loses the buff, like there's a timing issue or something like that, it typically shouldn't happen. The person who has the enlightenment buff can always take the shields off. Once the shield's off, anyone can actually kill the ads. The other thing if you really get stuck is if you use stasis or something like that, you can actually freeze them and keep them from sacrificing on the plates because that's your goal. You're trying to stop them from sacrificing on the plate. Also for the team going forward, there will be barrier champions you have to deal with. Once that is complete and you think the other team's getting ready to open up their box, what I would do is once you kill that initial set of ads, just kill some ads. And then as you see the, the timer going down, just go ahead and reconnect. Go ahead and reconnect, rebuff your timer so it gets basically back up to the maximum. Because what's gonna happen shortly is once the team that went to two opens up their tether box, there's going to be a teleporter that'll open up between one and two. That teleporter box will allow you, that runner, to basically help support both teams at one and two. So the runner at that point, all they're gonna do is they're gonna go through that portal. They're gonna help that person kill ads. They're gonna be paying attention to their timer because their timer is gonna be synced up to the person on one at that point. And then they're going to, ha once most of the ads are cleared out, they're going to go and rebuff by basically, again, the person who's at two is going to stand closest to the, the forward portion of the tether point and the box. And they're also going to be the one that shoots it. And the person who's running is just going to slide behind them and connect it. Now, this is really important because what the mechanic ends up being is now at this point, one and two are set up from a protection standpoint from being able to get the buff back and forth. And the runner is just gonna go back and forth as the timers are counting down for each of the people's buffs. The reason I have someone who is the standing at the plate stand close to the box where they shoot it is because the runner is just gonna go back and forth and literally just connect to the, it's the quickest way to do it. So literally I'm gonna say, I'm going back to one from two. So let's say I'm at two, I say, I'm going back to one. When I do that, that tells the person on the other end, as long as the ads are in decent shape, they're gonna go and shoot their tether box. So the minute I slide through that portal, I connect, we're done. I can stay with them for a few minutes, or not a few minutes, but a period of time, a few seconds. I can help them clear ads. But then when my, when my timer starts getting a bit lower again, or I think it's, and this is the thing that you can do. If for some reason, the other person that's at two, their timer is running out. When it gets about to 10, call it out if I haven't come back at that point. But then I'm gonna go back, 
I'm gonna slide behind them because they're gonna have a shot, a shot the box and I instantly get it retimed. So that's one of the reasons why it's important to have the person who's defending the base stand close to the tether box. The other piece of advice I would give you is that I would definitely use your weakest players between one and two if you have players that are new because those are the easiest ones to defend. The other thing is as you get further on the three to four, the timing gets tricky to try to basically get back and forth. Because what happens after this is that the team continues on to go to three. They leave someone behind. They go to four. Once they go to four, they're going to turn on a teleport box between three and four. But here's the key. There's also now a teleport box between four and one. So basically, there's teleport boxes throughout these. You can see on this map, there's teleport boxes throughout this. So the runners actually can help. If a runner's stuck, let's say the uh, the team, the person on, on four is stuck, but the person who is helping out with them, the runner that's on the right side is stuck at three. You can have the runner that's on the left side go all the way around the four through the portals if they need to, but that's just an emergency. So at this point, you're just gonna continue to kind of continue to do this. The runners are supporting the people who are defending the bases and the people on the bases are killing the ads. But at some point at the different locations, you're gonna have angelic show up, a series of angelics. This is where burst supers, burst uh, anything that's really good at killing ads really quickly are going to be a requirement because you have to get them down quickly once you've done that at the plates once the angelics are down and people call out i need help at four i need help at two i need help at three and the runners are really good at this right the runners will be the ones kind of helping out there's a lot of communication in this raid once all of those are down all the angelics for all the plates the center force fields will open up and everyone will go in the middle once you go to the middle it gets a little hectic once you go to the middle, what you're going to do is you're going to need, basically, you're going to have ads show up, you're going to have Angelic show up, and in between that, you're going to need to connect the two tether boxes that are in the middle. Now, you do want, if possible, to have everyone in this path, and you want them kind of a little bit lined up because it can get messed up otherwise, because then everyone gets the debuff and kill ads. Now, not with power crept, it's not as big of a deal, like if you only have a few people, it should be fine, but keep in mind, the only people who can shoot the shielded ads are the people that have the, the buff on them. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Do this a few times, and then you get your loot. So again, this starts to build on top of some of what you've already done to help you understand portions of the later portions of the encounter of this raid. So in this next encounter, you're gonna add a few other mechanics. First off, you're gonna be adding Gambit to the raid, which is always interesting. You're also gonna be adding an eyes mechanic that's similar to what you had in Spire of Watcher, but a little bit different. So you're gonna divide up into three, into two teams of three. One team is gonna be your Gambit team. The other team is gonna be your Eyes team. I would say your more experienced players should probably do Eyes if at all possible. But again, it's good to experiment, let people get experience. If you look at this map, you'll see that the boss that shows up will go in one of four directions and you'll have to follow him. This is the Eyes team that will be doing this. One of the things you see here is a little circle. That's called the watching machine. It's one way to kind of keep straight where you're going and, and to, Give yourself a mile marker to be able to tell where on the map things are. The watching sheet's basically a rotating tub that looks like a watching machine. So if you use that, it'll help you ground where things are in this map. And people actually have call outs. Each team will be different on these four locations because the ice team needs to follow the boss very quickly. The other four locations are where you're gonna have to go for boss damage, but also we're gonna have to do put moats into a bank. Yes, there's, there's no drifter, but there is gambit in this encounter. So at the very beginning, you're gonna link up and everyone's gonna get the debuff so they can kill the ads that have the buff on them. Immediately, you're gonna notice that there will be a Minotaur in one of the four locations where you also see for boss DPS. Whichever location that first Minotaur dies on, you'll notice at the far end of that lane, you'll see a lit up area. That is the bank where you have to put the moats in. What I would do, because again, you already have ads that are going to that bank that have shields on them. What we typically do is your goal is to get 30 moats in that bank to get the boss DPS. So again, remember in here, there is DPS in this encounter and I'll walk through once we get to the boss damage, what you potentially need as far as weapons and loadouts and things like that. So the, what you have is you, again, you have the three people who are on the moats team, the gambit team. I would immediately have that one first person, because again, I would order them. This is the first person, second person, third person. That, be, that comes really important later. I would have that person pick up those five moats. It's very important when you do this encounter that whenever you kill a Minotaur, do not pick up the moats unless it's your turn to do so. That can really mess this encounter up. That person will want to then speed as fast as possible down to the bank to put those moats in. 
Now, with changes to the game, you could probably use Eager Edge. There's probably lots of things you can do to do faster. This was always a stretch sometimes when we were doing this at the very beginning of the raid. You also wanna make sure that you give yourself as much time as possible because, again, your debuff or the buff to take the shields off is based on putting either connecting the tethers or putting banks, putting moats in the bank. So if you're down there, you still have some of your timer, just go ahead and kill some of the ads. If you don't, you're getting close. Again, I would wait until the last possible second to give the team as much time as possible. Then go ahead, put your five moats in. At that point, you have your, your thing refreshed. Go ahead and start killing ads, stay at that particular location. At that point, everyone else continues, and I'm, I'm primarily gonna focus on the gamut team for now. What you're going to do is you're going to continue to slay out ads in the middle, the other two people that are on the gamut team, and, and also the people with eyes, even though they will move from time to time and not be available. You're going to kill where the minotaurs are and pick up the moats. The next person, that second person on the moat team, is going to pick up 10 moats. So they're going to pick up 10 moats. As soon as they have that, they book it down in the same location. If you've timed this correctly, you should get down there in time to put it in, and the person who was down there at the beginning still has timer. If you don't, that's where you can run into some issues where you have shielded enemies, but you don't have a buff to be able to kill them at this point. Some tricks, if you do that, you can use swords, kind of knock them off, you can use stasis. But again, as you get your timing, this shouldn't be a big issue. So have that second person come down, put their, their moats in the bank. Once they do that, have the first person who came down there go all the way back to the middle. So go down and support that third person who's still in the middle. Once you get back there, the third person is going to start getting their moats. They're going to try to get to 10, which is going to require killing two minotaurs. Once they have their 10 moats, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to go back, and it's just a rotation. Then at the last, per the first person who went, that person at that point, their timer is going to be expired, so they'll be able to pick moats up again. At that point, they'll go and kill five and take it in. That gives you 30. It's five, then 10, then 10, then five. Now, timing-wise, when that happens, DPS is going to start. But I'm going to pause there. I'm going to talk about the ice team. For the ice team, you're basically helping the support kill ads, but you're following the boss around. When you're following the boss around, he'll go to one of four locations on the map that I show that, that I show on this map here. For that, they're going to go and follow. And what we typically do is this uh, this piece portion of the counter requires you picking up the spit that gives you the voltaic, which gives the 2:30 uh, timer where you can't pick it up again. So you're going to want as long as everyone's quick. You're going to want to have all three people because the goal is you're trying to keep everyone from wiping, but also giving the gambit team enough time to complete their jobs because that's how you get the DPS. Once you follow him in, let's say you're the first person, what you're gonna do is you're gonna have the other two people go on the left and go on the right. Typically what we do is we just, we basically set that as a default. Like I'm always gonna go left, I'm gonna go, always go right unless I'm in the center, right? And we kind of work that out as a fire team. But let's say you're the first person who's gonna pick up the buff. You're gonna personal left, personal right, keep out anywhere close to the um, spit because you can pick it up potentially and then that's gonna mess up your run. The person who picks it up in the middle, first off, if you wanna give the Gambit team more time, you can delay it a little bit. There's like a three, four second timer before it'll wipe the fire team. So typically I'll let it sit there for a few seconds and I'll pick it up again to give everyone time to kind of center. So again, one person on the left, one person on the right, one person in the middle. The person who's in the middle can't move once he picks up, but he can see, if you look at this diagram, you can see if it's the inner eyes or the outer eyes, it'll be one or the other. So in other words, the three people have to shoot the different, the different eyes in a period of time to prevent having an issue with the boss. Once you decide if it's inner or outer, the person on the left shoots the left one, the person on the right shoots the right one, and the person in the middle um, does the center one. Now, one thing you can do is if someone's struggling killing theirs because of the weapons they have, a lot of times I use SMGs, auto rifles, you can use snipers, but you can all use all sorts of weapons. But again, just make sure it's something you're comfortable. Again, just like Spire of the Watcher, being able to take those eyes down. So once all three eyes are down, then the boss will move again. Now, one of the things, if you if someone shoots the wrong one, it'll actually kill the person that's in the center. So that's that can be a potential issue. Now, one thing that is good is if they die, then they lose their timer and they can pick up the, the buff again. So that is one positive thing for actually screwing this portion of the encounter up. So then you're gonna rinse and repeat. If you time everything correctly, you're gonna do this a total of three times before boss DPS. And again, what you'll do at that point is the second person will pick it up. You'll separate in the left and right, you'll shoot. And again, it'll always be in a different location. Once this is all complete, you'll see a message that shows up on your screen and that'll tell you, and the boss will start uh, going away in a hurry. He's always gonna go back to where the Gambit team is. So worst case is if you get confused, you don't know where to go to DPS, go where you see the rest of your fire team. As long as you do that, you're fine. 
So at that point, DPS is really simple. DPS is primarily precision damage, uh, but he moves. So Divinity is really good. Think of Spire the Watcher again. Anything like that will work. Now you can use rockets, other things, but precision damage works really well on this boss and also DPS supers. One thing you want to do is um, he's going to move. So a well or anything is not going to be that useful. You can use a tether. Some people have seen they use a tether at the beginning. It gives him a debuff. It kind of slows him down a little bit. But as you're doing DPS, what you're going to do is you want to move a little bit for forward because a shield will drop down if you stand all the way in the back. They're not going to let you sit in the back of that location and just plink them away with snipers. You will have to move. Once you're past that barrier, though, you don't have to move again. So it just move up a little bit and you should be fine. What we do again is that it's just plink them, plink them, plink them. If you do a really good job, you go in one phase. If you don't, then you just do this whole encounter over again. So again, the keys in this are... You're going to, the, the team with the moats, they're going to go 5, 10, 10, 5. They're going to get their moats. The eyes team is going to follow him around, shoot his eyes, make sure they're timing who's picking up the buff when, and then that is the entire encounter. After this, there's going to be another jumping puzzle before you get to the final boss. Once you get to the final boss, you're going to pull a lot of these mechanics that you've already been doing into one place. So let's walk through that. So once you get in the room, and I'll put up a map to show you, you're going to notice tether boxes again. And you're going to notice that there's tether boxes, again, if you look at this, all over this encounter. And you can connect those. More to come on those. You're also going to notice the, the, the boss in the middle of the, of the room. You're also going to notice that the, the boxes have, if you look at it, there's really an orange side and a blue side, right? Kind of dark and light. You're going to split up into three groups of two. There's a team one and a team two. More about that in a minute. And there's also two people who are going to be helping to defend this area on a regular basis and potentially connecting boxes. So we'll have one of the, one of those people on the left, one of those people's on the right. For team one and team two, for now, when they're defending at the beginning, I would just have them also divide up in the left and right. But they will be they will be operating as one team later on in the encounter. So rally up and start the encounter. You're gonna divide up in your teams, and again, left and right, even though you're operating with the two, the, the teams as I laid them out before the three teams, you're kind of still spread out and making sure there's enough people to guard the left and enough people to guard the right. So you're slaying out adds, you're also killing angelics. One thing to keep in mind is there also be some cyclops that show up. These are very important because the cyclops have to be shot. They're kind of tanky and they need to be shot to be able to progress the encounter. So a lot of times we'd have a dedicated person kind of helping that. A lot of times it was a person staying behind, the two people who don't go through the portals. So at that point, what you're going to notice is that the crit spots on the boss open up. So we're going to want to send the blue team first, the first team through the blue portal. To do that, we shoot that crit spot on the left and that person, go, that, that team of two goes through. Their goal at this point is to slay out. So this is where supers, again, for the Gambit team, supers that allow you, like Nova Bomb, things like that, things that allow you to kill a lot of ads really quickly are really good, or, or weapons that allow you to do that. So do that, and when you go through, you're going to have two different variants of ads that show up. One will give you more moats than the other. So one thing is sometimes if you're running short on time, if you know you, the first team went through, got the majority of the moats, right? They can usually say, hey, I got this many moats, right? As they're, as they're running out. Um, that will tell the next team that they don't have to pick up all the moats. They don't have to kill anything, but kill as many before they come back. So once you're comfortable, you've picked up all the moats, you will then say, pull left. The people on the outside will then shoot, shoot the weak spot again, which will then open up a portal. That portal will allow you to come back through, but it'll also require team two to go through and do the exact same thing. So you do need to be in the position where you can have the team two go through. Now, one of the things that can mess you up is, what, you know, obviously having the debuff to shoot the shielded ads is important. It is possible not to time this where you won't have that. So it's also really important to make sure you're timing when you send people back and forth. So at this point, Team one goes and they will notice that one of the portals on the left is lit up, okay? One of the banks, because there's multiple banks. They will go to that, they will put the the moats in. What I typically like to do is, the first, I, I divide it up where one person puts theirs in immediately, the other person, because let's say the second team struggles with putting their moats in or getting their moats and you run out of your debuff. Well, then you can't kill the shielded ads. So what I typically like to do is I typically like to go and I say, Okay, the first person put their moats immediately. The second person, maybe wait five, 10 seconds, right? Because you can still help with ads, you just can't take the shields off. Then put yours in. That way you have more on your timer and you give yourself some insurance policy. So again, especially with new teams, that's a good thing to do. Once you're done with that, the second team goes, they get all their moats, they do the exact same thing. They get pulled, they come back, they put all of their moats in the bank. 
So at that point, that if you've gotten 30, that bank is full and you'll hear a little sound as well as you'll, you'll see that the, the bank is, you know, is lit up like it's full. The other advantage that when you do that is that there will no longer be any shielded ads that show up on that left-hand side. So at that point, if you struggle, you can focus the people with the debuff on the right side if that, if that continues to be an issue for you. When you do that, obviously the next thing that's happening is you could run out of that buff to be able to shoot the shields off. So at that point, that's why you need to quickly kill as many ads as possible, get the first team. So again, team one and team two went through on the left side, they got out of their moats. At that team, team one is then going the orange side because you got light moats on the blue side, you're gonna get dark moats on the orange side. So almost immediately, as soon as that team two comes in and banks their moats, you're gonna wanna, because again, you wanted them to have their debuffs, everyone's protected. You're gonna want team one to then go on the orange side. So at that point, you're gonna shoot a crit spot on the right-hand side of the boss, and you're gonna send team one through to collect moats. One of the things that's really key with this is if you don't time it correctly, that team two that came in and put their moats in, their debuff is gonna be expiring on the right-hand side. It's really important for the first team as they come in that second time to do it as quickly as possible. Once they come back then, you're gonna as quickly as possible identify which bank is, le uh, is linked up. And the first person to do that, if you have Eager Edge or something, just get there as quickly as possible because many, in many cases, if you're not careful, you'll have things getting close to the bank and, and they'll sacrifice. And if they sacrifice, they actually take some of the moats off of that bank which then means you have to go back to do more. And this whole thing is time before a white mechanic. So it's really important to never let anything sacrifice. So at that point, do the same thing. Team one goes in and puts their moats. Team two goes in and puts their moats. At that point, you have both banks closed. And this is when you're gonna get ready for DPS. The other thing that I didn't mention is that for the people who stayed behind, obviously, why did we leave them behind? You'll notice that the boss, as you're shooting things, that the floors are disappearing. The only way to get floors back, again, if we look at the map, is to connect the tether ports that are near them. If you do that, then obviously you get those floor portions back. But the, the balance that you have to have is you're killing ads, you're trying to clear everything out. When you actually try to go in and tether that, you can't shoot. So you have to be very careful when you do this because if you don't time it correctly, you're all sitting there stuck and you can't shoot anything. So, you know, obviously do it where you can or ignore it, right? You could ignore the floors with, with our survivability now. It is a little bit easier to do this, but again, that's something, and again, for people who are staying behind that aren't the tether people, either stay out of way of the tether boxes when they're trying to connect them, or if you can't do that, help them out, right? But if you're not comfortable, just stay out of their way. They'll say, hey, I'm going to the right to do this one. Go over to the left, right? You can still kill ads from the left-hand side of the map. Once this is all complete and you connected both tether boxes and everything's full, you're going to see the boss step up and he's going to put a plus symbol up that's either dark or light, right? So again, using the map, you're going to decide which box you have to connect. So again, just like you did when you were connecting the floors. So, and it's gonna be one that's near the boss as well. So what we do at that point is we divide up into two groups of three. There's the connection team and there's a DPS team because you can start DPS as soon as the connection is made. Let's say the connection point is on the right-hand side, the orange side. If that's the case, the team doing DPS is going to get out of their way and go over to the left and gather near a conflux. Again, because you don't wanna get in the way of the tether. The three people then go to the right and they go from a connection point up until where the boss is at and try to connect them. Now, this is where people struggle. A lot of times, you know, some of the plates aren't there, people are getting damaged, um, you know, someone has to shoot. I would designate one person to kind of shoot the box to start the thing and then just make sure if you have to, just keep jumping until you connect it. But this is where a lot of people struggle. It's not that difficult, but the timing is really important and you definitely need to keep the other three people out of the middle of your tether. As soon as you connect that, everyone else can do DPS, including you, but you're not going to be in a good position. So again, that, that other three people that are not connecting the box, they go to a conflux, set up a well, whatever you need, and start wailing on the boss. The DPS phase for this boss is very tight. And he has a thing where you do DPS at the, t uh, you know, at the bottom, he floats up in the air, and then he comes back down. So again, it's just very tight. Um, you know, you can use all sorts of things, you know, uh, using snipers, using linears, using precision is good as long as you have a divinity. But again, it's a very short DPS phase. He doesn't have a ton of health, but it's a very short DPS phase. So you just kind of have to maximize what you're doing. If for some reason you don't do enough DPS to take him out, then you're going to a second phase. And then there's an enrage mechanic if it goes too long, right? I think he can go three phases before it wipes the entire fire team. Again, 
The, the issue with that is that's why you want to get as quickly as possible because this encounter, one of the reasons people get stuck in this ray besides Divinity Runs is once you get to this, everyone has to have a job, a job they have to do. And if someone makes a mistake, it's very hard to recover from. Like if someone dies in the wrong area because you have very defined teams that have to go in a very quick succession. Um, but once you do it, it's incredible getting through the raid. Again, this is one of my favorite raids. I think it's beautiful. I think it, the scenery, the mechanics, the fact that they build on the mechanics in a very subtle way after each encounter, I think it's a very well-designed raid and underappreciated. That's the video. If you like the video, feel free to like it, subscribe to my channel, check my Discord, and I'll see you guardians in the tower.